it's not enough for animals or plants to survive, they have to reproduce as well. Yeah, without reproduction, no offspring are left, and any organisms that don't leave any offspring, obviously there, whatever makes them not to have offspring, that will die out. What we see around us uh, in animals and humans are animals and plants and humans that have a long line of ancestors who have successfully reproduced. If your ancestors had not successfully reproduced, you would not be here. So reproduction is really important, and reproduction in um, certainly in uh, all the vertebrates requires uh, uh, two sexes, male and female. Uh, they sometimes have different roles. Their role differentiated sometimes. In this particular case, the male is the one who is building the nest. That is unusual, actually. Normally, it's either both sexes together or only the female. Uh, just if you count up the number of species that do it. Um, and then we had the female evaluating uh, the male in some way. Of course, the male not only has the nest, but has his own color and has his display and has his uh, song. You heard the song. We wouldn't really call it song. It's a screech. It's really pretty irritating. I don't know how the females stand it, but to them, maybe it sounds, it sounds beautiful. It probably does sound beautiful if, uh, if they have to make any of these names. And so the female then evaluates, uh, although the video says the female evaluates the males based on the skill with which they build the nest, there's no evidence for that. Uh, but the female may be integrating various uh, kinds of uh, cues, and then the female settle down. So um, <clears throat> we'll talk about a number of these sorts of processes. And um, to begin with, a description of um, the way in which animals get together and, and breed is called the mating system, and you may have heard some of these terms. Monogamy is when one male and one female settle down. Uh, whatever that means, uh, in birds often it means that they both share the same space, the same territory, and um, and what happens subsequently varies a little bit. So whether they build the nest together and raise the young together, or whether one of them builds a nest and only one of them feeds the young, or both of them cooperate, that uh, is variable from uh, species to species. And then we have polygamy. Polygamy is where we have one member of one of the sexes uh, who mates with or forms a social bond with, a social group with multiple members of the opposite sex. And if it's a single male and multiple females, we call it polygyny or polygyny, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And if it's a single a female and multiple males, says polyandry. Polyandry is relatively rare. <coughs> Uh, in the animal kingdom as a whole, it's also rare in birds, but 1% of bird species are polyandrous, but there are uh, polyandrous species. So, for example, uh, in our <coughs> country, we have a Cinerea stit, which is a monogamous species. Uh, and then the, uh, the weavers are all uh, are polygynous. This is a streaked weaver. Uh, also building a nest, you can see uh, this species again, the males build the nests. And we have a polyandrous species like this barred button quail. So we have quite a diversity in how males and females get together for the serious purpose of reproduction. And whenever there's diversity, there's opportunity for us. We always are curious, why is there diversity? How exactly does it work out and so on? And an early theory, uh, which maybe stands still uh, to some degree, is by Emden and Oring, trying to understand why we sometimes get monogamy and why we sometimes get uh, polygamy. And uh, they suggested that this is really up to the females. So they says that females, when they are um, uh, deciding where to settle, where to live, and raise their offspring, are basically settling based on the distribution of resources. So if you're an insectivore, you settle down based on that. If you're a granivore, you settle down based on that, and so on and so forth. And if the resources are widespread and scattered, then what we get is we get one female settled here, one female settled there, one female settled somewhere else. Whereas if we get resources that are clumped, I've got this green patch and everything else is barren and bare, and that green patch over there, then multiple females will settle down and there won't be any females in the spaces in between. And they suggest that when females are scattered out, spread out, <clears throat> a single male cannot ever hope to monopolize multiple females. He can't hope to defend a territory that's large enough to encompass the home ranges of several females. But when females are clumped together because the resources are clumped together, then such a thing can happen. So this is, as shown in this uh, schematic over here, this kind of situation where we have uh, females, which are the blue, which are following resources, they're scattered about, and so then we have males, which are you know, the green circles. And we have monogamy, one male, one female. Um, and uh, But over here, we have something different. We have single male territory can uh, overlap 
with multiple uh, female uh, homemakers. Now, note that there's no, nobody ever says that in any of these mating systems, all birds find a mate. In fact, if you have a 50-50 sex ratio in adult birds, yeah, then maybe in the case of monogamy, all birds find a mate. But if the species is polygamous, then by definition, all birds will not find a mate, if their sex ratio is 50-50. Because if you have some males who are able to monopolize multiple females, by definition, there will be some males who will not have a mate at all. Okay, So don't imagine that in polygamous species, all males, all individual males, uh, are able to uh, have multiple uh, females in their territories. And by and large, something like this seems to, uh, seems to happen. Um, and, but apart from females just settling on resources, females also pay very close attention to males themselves. And they seem to exert some kind of choice, some kind of preference. It's very interesting to examine what these preferences are. And the first question to ask, I've been talking about females prefer and so on, females choose. But the first question to ask is, why should in any sexually reproducing organism, why should one sex be choosy and maybe the other not? We're used to this kind of language. So let me begin by asking you, what makes a male a male and a female a female? Gametes. Gametes? So you said that? Yeah. Okay, what do you mean? Can you? If, if you take humans as an example, you would have, in at least our uh, chromosomal order, you would have XX for a female and XY for a male, right? Mm. As a determining factor. Yeah, but I could easily call a uh, woman a male and a man a female. I mean, what, why, uh, why are human, what, what is common, let's say, between human males and uh, elephant males and deer and, and tree? Trees as well. We have male parts of the flower, or in some trees we have, or plants we have separate male and female individuals. What makes those males males and the females females? Females have got Well, the good gamete is mortal in which sex? The males. The males. Yeah? Is there a way? Through a vector it goes somewhere. Yes, yes, somewhere here. Females give birth, right? Females give birth in mammals? In birds, in fish, yeah. what, what do you mean they give birth? I mean, so, I mean, I mean so they are the source of, uh, I mean, they produce offspring, right? <laughs> That's debatable. So, I mean, it depends on what you mean by produce offspring. And I think the, the, it comes down to these two things, that uh, that sex, which has small and motile, mobile gametes, tends to be called male, and that sex that produces, and, and that sex tends to produce large numbers because they're small. And much we talk about investment in reproduction. So for the same investment in reproduction, if I make small gametes, I can make many more. But if I make large, nutrient-rich gametes, and uh, then I can't make a large number of them. And because they are large, they are unlikely to be able to move very much, either of their own accord or through a vector. So typically, what we call a male is that sex which produces a large number of small, cheap, so to speak, gametes that tend to move. And uh, females are those that produce small number of more expensive in that nutrition, more expensive, energetically more expensive. And this difference in gamete size is called anisogony. Otherwise, the gametes are that there are some sexually reproducing species, some algae and so on, which have isogamous gametes. That is, the gametes are of the same size of the male and female. So there is a bit arbitrary which one we call male, which we call female in our definition. And that isogony, people have argued, have produced several interesting outcomes. Um, Bateman uh, is a, a Drosophila biologist and he uh, conjectured that <clears throat> one outcome of this is if in Drosophila I give a male, a female to mate with and then another female to mate with, another female to mate with and so on and I look at how many offspring that male uh, sires is a father to, yeah, then the more females he mate with, mates with the more offspring he will have. But he conjectured that if I give a female a male to mate with, and then another male to mate with, another male and another male, that the number of offspring she has will not increase linearly with the number of mates, because at some point she's going to reach a limit of the number of eggs that she can produce, because eggs are large and expensive and so on. Yeah? Does that make sense uh, logically? So he argued, and he showed this uh, with his fruit flies experiment, he the same prediction. So he argued that uh, uh, for a male it always makes sense to try and find another mate and another mate and another mate because that's how his reproductive success increases. 
the female, once she's found a mate, or maybe two or maybe three, her reproductive success doesn't increase any further. So therefore, the female should be the choosy sex, and the male would be the non-choosy sex. So the males would be competing amongst each other for attention, uh, for the female's attention. And that sounded all very nice, but it didn't explain some anomalies. And we'll come to some of the anomalies later. And Trivers in the 70s said, well, really, it's not only about the gametes, but it's about the entire investment that the sex puts into reproduction. The gametes are only one part of the investment that an animal or a plant puts into reproduction. It's not only that. For mammals, of course, females both produce the eggs and also gestate. In birds, the equivalent is incubation. You produce the eggs, but then incubation happens. And of course, many times females do incubate, but there are birds in which males incubate. After incubation, the chicks hatch. Uh, for certainly for altricial birds, birds that stay in the nest for quite a while, maybe not so much for precaution birds, they also have to be fed and taken care of. And again, many times it's the, it's the female that takes care of the uh, offspring, many times it's both the sexes, but there are also instances of the reverse. So he said if you add up all the parental investment, producing the egg, and uh, incubating it and feed, taking care of the young ones, if you add all that up, whichever sex invests more is the sex that will be limiting for the other one. And they will be, that will be the sex that is choosing. And we'll come to some examples where uh, actually we have the reverse of the pattern I described, where males invest much more in reproduction, and males are therefore the choosy sex, and females are ones that compete with each other for access to males. Okay, so it's not inevitable because of anisogamy. There are other things going on as well, in particular parental investment. But the consequence of all this is that the sexes have, we we think, have differential variation in reproductive success. So the sex that invests most is the one that is choosy. They will always get a mate, mostly always. And their reproduction is not constrained by how many mates they have. So there won't be so much variation in reproductive success. Whereas the male that's competing for the, the rare sex, the, the sex that invests more in parental, uh, in, um, uh, in reproduction, there will be some that don't get any mates. And there will be some that get many mates. So the typical view, again, uh, on average, it's the males that have more variation in reproductive success. And in particular, if you think back to the polygamous species, where there are some males that can get many females and some males that get none, it means there's lots of variation in reproductive success. Yeah. Whereas in monogamous species, we think, because pretty much every bird pairs up with a mate, there's not so much variation in reproductive success. That is, all females get roughly the same number of offspring, and all males get roughly the same number of offspring. And this is a very crude generalization I'm making. Obviously, it doesn't turn out, you don't have identical. It's not like all birds have the same number because there's all matter of other things, which I'm not going to talk about today. People have looked at mate quality, right? So the quality of the mate that you get might also matter a lot, not just, okay, there's a male, that's that's fine, or there's a female, that's fine, but the quality of the mate might matter. And that could affect your reproductive success as well. So there are some um, reasons for mate choice, um, and how, uh, how individuals display their you know, display to the choosy sex varies. So you can have, um, and I'm just going to use the short form by saying males display, okay, but remember there are exceptions. So males sometimes have ornamentation, like the uh, the weavers had the bright color and so on. They have vocalization that would be very complex. A lot of the songbirds, the pipe bush chats, my fellow robins, you've heard these, they might vocalize. We are increasingly actually realizing it's not only males that sing, but some in many species females sing as well. And that's a fascinating new area of research that people are getting into. Uh, what is the function of female song and, and so on. Uh, they can display, here's a lesser florican that male does this crazy display, where it jumps up and then floats down back in its feathers. Um, and they may also um, compete, males might compete to get the best territories because females may be choosing for good resources and so the males compete for the locations that have lots of food, let's say for the for the offspring. So there are many um, different aspects on which mate choice could be based. And then the question arises, why why be choosing in the first place? Why don't you just mate with the first individual of the other sex that comes around? Be done with it and you go have your, your offspring. 
we do see that uh, birds don't do this. And so there are two general ideas about why uh, females, I'm using that as shorthand, remember that's not always the case, uh, why females might choose. One is that they get some direct benefits, and direct benefits uh, uh, can be very varied. In some birds, there's something called courtship feeding, the male feeds the female, and uh, remember when the females are, are making eggs, eggs are, uh, bird eggs at least, are huge and expensive things to make. Yeah, you're putting all this investment of calcium and protein and other um, uh, nutrition into this egg. <coughs> and then you lay, and then you lay another one, and another one, and another one. And like Anand was talking with the kiwi that lays such a huge egg, of course it lays a huge egg because it doesn't fly. Flying birds can't afford to make large eggs because they wouldn't be able to fly effectively, so they have to make smaller eggs. But if you take the cumulative investment into, into eggs, um, you know, some birds lay club size of three or four, others lay, like he talked about, I think some of the ducks and so on, lay 12, 15, uh, 18 eggs. It's a massive amount of investment. That, um, which by the way, ma also happens in mammals, but in mammals, the investment is not in producing the egg, the investment is in the gestation and the lactation. The massive cost of reproduction. So because of this cost of reproduction, any benefit, any food or access to food the female can get might be something that she might use as the basis on which to choose. So direct benefits can include courtship feeding, but also the territory and the territory quality that she gets, because that's not only good for her when she's make, uh, making her eggs, but it's also good for the chicks once they hatch out, because it's easier to feed them and they'll have higher quality food. So it's possible that some of these ornaments and displays and so on that males uh, show are related, are a way for females to uh, gauge which males are able to provide those direct benefits either by feeding or through the territory and so on. Yeah. The other idea that has captured scientists' imagination more than this is what has been called in the literature indirect benefits, which actually means genetic benefits, which means that if males are of different genetic quality, then, and if I mate with this particular male, then my offspring would inherit his high genetic quality. Let's say males vary in their ability to combat disease in their immune system. Right? So if I mate with a male with a better immune system that doesn't help me directly, doesn't help me feed my chicks, but if that uh, ability, uh, that immune system, uh, quality of immune system is heritable, then my offspring will also get uh, you know, a high immune system. Now remember, when we are, and I'm saying this and also emotionally said about making decisions and so on, remember we're not talking about anybody or any bird making conscious decisions. It's not like a female is sitting here and saying, that one is like this, and that one is like that, and I don't know. Or in Moshmi's case, we talk about foraging. You know, we are not imagining that they are the mathematical and graphical models she showed. They don't have them, presumably, presumably, they don't have them in their head. And they're not doing differential calculus in their head and figuring out what the optimum is. Yeah. The idea is instead, we're using this as a shorthand for the expectation that over evolutionary time, these uh, attributes of the animals and plants get optimized such that they're making rules, they have rules of thumb, some decision rule, but they're not doing uh, uh, calculus, but they're deciding to one thing or the other based on some proxy. It's just like, well, not just like, but imagine, you know, when you, uh, you somebody throws a cricket ball at you and you're running to catch it, you're not calculating the trajectory of the parabola that is, uh, you know, described by the cricket ball. You're not calculating, okay, on what acceleration uh, do I, you know, velocity do I need to go by, and, you know, I need to account for my slowing down and all. You're not doing any of these mathematical calculations. Nevertheless, you're able to do it. So, we're not assuming, uh, by, by using the shorthand, by saying decision and so on, we're not, we're not uh, claiming that animals and plants and so on are actually doing the calculations. So, but that's the logic. The idea is that those birds that, through whatever means, choose males of high quality, and if those the high quality is heritable, they will have more offspring than those females that make the wrong, quote unquote, wrong choice. And that means, and if their their way of making the choice is also heritable, then their children will inherit not only the high quality immune system, but their daughters will also inherit whatever it is in their brains that made them choose this kind of male versus that kind of male. And therefore, we should expect that those choices to spread through the population. So it's really a shorthand for that rather complicated uh, set of uh, reasoning. Now, there's a lot of work done on, especially on these indirect genetic benefits. And I'm not going to talk a lot about it. There's, it's a topic, and you can do an entire whatever semester-long course just on uh, mating systems and mate choice and sexual selection. 
uh, there's a lot that you can follow up on and make sense of literature on this. But I just wanted to point out that this thing, which is the actual direct food and direct quality of the territory the male get and the female gets, because it's so obvious, has received much less attention. And people have been chasing these things, which are really elusive. It's been very hard to demonstrate that females get any genetic or indirect benefits uh, by being choosy among males. Um, so there's really, I think, a lot more to be done by looking at just the direct benefits. What is the territory quality? People don't measure that kind of thing. You know, what are the immediate benefits that females are getting that allow them to make bigger and better eggs, that allow them to, you know, uh, feed their offspring better, and so on. Um, one interesting aspect that's mixed up with all this is this thing called sexual dimorphism, where males and females look different. They could be of different sizes. Uh, very often in birds, they are different colors. Um, and uh, not always uh, different colors, but uh, sometimes, uh, uh, quite often, in this case, there's a polygamous species, remember? The males are brighter than the females. In the breeding season, in the non-breeding season, the male, like Ashwin said, the males molt out. And in the breeding season, they molt back into this, uh, this very bright color. And presumably the reason they do that, uh, rather than keep the bright plumage all year round, it is because the bright plumage only gives them any advantage in the breeding season. Whereas in the non-breeding season, it's a disadvantage because they are presumably more conspicuous predators and so on. So you'd rather only uh, take on the bright plumage when you have to. And females are like this all year round. But it's not always only, only that males are better than females ever. Uh, you can also get a situation where females are brighter than males. So this is, yeah, we know what this is? This is a painted snipe, yeah, from India, and this is the male, and that's the female. And people who don't know this very often make a mistake, they take a photo and say, oh, this is a male, it's such a nice, beautiful male. No, that's a nice, beautiful female. Um, and so you do get the, the reverse, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, and so we get this, uh, situation where, which used to be called, maybe some people still call it role reversed, um, and you know this becomes a bit politically charged. Where, you know, uh, in nature there's no ethical particular rule, but we also don't want to take any lesson, uh, ethical lesson for human society. So we have to be a bit careful when we talk about this. Um, polyandrous species, and you know that there are human polyandrous societies as well, or used to be at least. Poly in polyandrous species, you have a single female that essentially defends multiple males. And she defends these multiple males from other females. Okay, And what the polyandrous uh, birds uh, do, uh, typically, is, uh, so the females then has lots of, they, she has lots of husbands, let's just call them that for convenience. And uh, she will mate with a male, and lay a clutch of eggs, and then he will subsequently do all the rest of the parental care. Yeah, He incubates the young ones, he feeds the chicks, until they are independent and so on. And she goes on then to the next male in her territory and lays a clutch of eggs for him. And then he takes care and so on. And the next and next and so on. And they can have three, four, five husbands this way. And all the rest of the time, when they are not uh, laying their eggs uh, for the males, the rest of the time they are defending their territory against other females, other females next door who might want to come in and take over the territory from them. And this is almost exactly analogous you know, to the opposite thing where it's the male that has a large territory and is defending multiple females against other males. Now I want to tell you a little story about this. You might know of a, uh, a phenomenon called infanticide in some mammals where um, in uh, polygamous mammals, so in lions and in uh, Hanuman langurs, the grey langurs this is known, where you tend to have these unimale groups, multiple females. But if the, the dominant male is overthrown by an outsider, you know, kicked out or killed or something by an outsider in both males and, and langurs, the new male will systematically, I don't know if it always happens, but it, it does happen, that will systematically kill all the babies uh, in that group. And the idea there is that by doing so, that the babies of course are not his babies, they are sired by the previous male. And because of the long parental care in both lions and in langurs, uh, females with small babies are not available, they don't come back into estrus and won't reproduce until their offspring are independent. And by killing the young, uh, the males then, um, and this does happen, the females come into estrus much faster, and then the male is able to have his own offspring rather than take care of the offspring of the previous male. Again, remember we are not attributing any motivation or intention, it's the way that, it's the way that animals, we have motivation and intention. But 
I don't know if, you know, to what degree we can say that about plants and fungus. So, knowing this about mammals, some mammals, uh, a clever chap uh, called Emlyn, uh, St Stephen Emlyn, um, uh, said, well, we have the analogous system, the opposite <coughs> system in birds. I wonder whether infanticide happens there, but in the opposite direction. And so we studied this uh, <coughs> bird called the wattle jasana. Uh, this is in South America, uh, but of course we have jasanas in, in India as well. And they uh, follow the system that I said, females of large territory, multiple males, and so on. And what he did was, he said, well, I can't wait until, you know, for those rare events where some female takes over the territory of another female. So I will experimentally induce this. I will remove a female from a territory. And we know that when you remove the territorial animal, there are others waiting to occupy. And then we should see some action. So he removed females from territories, saw that another, either neighboring female or another female moved in and took over that territory and then watched to see what happened. And, uh, and sure enough, the new female that came in systematically found all the males on their nests and killed all the, you know, pecked all the eggs or if they were little chicks, killed all the chicks. And then a few days later, the males became, you know, whatever, ready again uh, to have their offspring and so she made with them and had her own clutch. And this, I should say that as an aside, this is a, you would agree with me, it's a bit of a cruel experiment because you are inducing it. You are making it happen by removing the female. And uh, the researchers who did this were very acutely aware of this. And they said that normally when we do, you know, experiments in the lab or something like that, you know, we want to do it enough times to be sure that, you know, what we are seeing is a real pattern, not something by chance. But because they were directly causing harm in the field, especially as they started to see the infanticide happen, they decided to stop at a sample size of four. So they only did this four times, remove a female four times. In three of the four times, a neighboring female came in and killed all the all the others and they stopped that and despite that small sample size they made a convincing argument in their paper and the paper that they published saying that we made a very clear decision not to continue beyond because we thought that even with a small sample size three out of four is enough evidence that this does happen in the reverse of what happens in that. So just a little aside about the um, the uh, the ethics of doing some of these things in the uh, in the field. When uh, we talk about, there's some sort of slightly broadly, uh, a little um, more about broad aspects of how we talk about behavior or other phenotypes, other traits. Um, we typically want to explain something. We want to say, you know, why is this, you know, what's up with this yellow plumage of the weaver bird? You know? Or uh, we might say, the, you know, the paradise flycatcher? You know that one where the males have this long streamer, ribbon-like tail? We might say, what's up with that? You know, why does this male have this? And for a long time, uh, different kinds of people approaching this question from different directions would come up with different answers and keep fighting each other, with each other about it. So, for example, you might say, oh yeah, the reason that the bioweaver has this yellow color is because uh, we know yellow is, is a carotenoid-induced uh, color and we know that uh, it depends on the diet. So it must be because the weavers are eating something specific that they're getting this yellow color. Right? That seems like a reasonable explanation. And then another set of people would say, that's all nonsense. I don't even know why it told me. Clearly the reason the reason that viewers have a yellow color is because females must be choosing. The color must be used either in male-male competition or in female choice. Right? And these two sets of people keep fighting and in you know different kinds of questions of of this uh, nature. But the you the important thing is to recognize that they're asking different, they're answering different questions. The first question is how, how is that plumage produced? And how is that plumage produced is a combination of what genes are switched on, how the physiology works, how the gene expression works, what diet, you know, what diet the animals have and so on. It's about what's happening in the body now. Those are called proximate questions. They're about what's happening right now to produce the phenotype or the trait that we, are, we, uh, we care about. And then there are the ultimate or the why questions. Those are the evolutionary questions. You can say, oh yeah, I know how it's produced, or I don't care how it's produced, I want to know why it's produced. Why on earth do male, females not have this, but males have this? You know, why does the male uh, parrot flycatcher have such a long tail? There has to be some evolutionary explanation, not just the gene expression and the, the how question. So I, when you are faced with questions like this, or you're posing your own sorts of questions, please try and identify in what rough category your question falls. Do you care about the physiology and genetics and the, the developmental biology? Or do you, are you more interested in, in the evolutionary 
gener history and generation of this of this uh, uh, the trait that you care about. And for this, I want to just recap for you what the logic of uh, the theory of natural selection. So we'll say always, we don't say evolution. Evolution is a, uh, a description of what happens, uh, but how things change over time, how animals, plants, organisms change over generation. Um, by the way, the fact that evolution uh, has occurred and occurs was very well known, not just to Darwin, but also his predecessors. What was less, what was not known was what is the mechanism that drives it? Why is it that we see change from generation to generation? And that's where Darwin had his, uh, so Epiphany and of course Wallace as well at roughly the same time. Uh, and that uh, mechanism is called natural selection. And I think that in the past couple of lectures we've had in discussion, we've talked, uh, we use the word fitness, we use the word reproductive success, something like that. Um, and these are all terms to do with uh, the mechanism of natural selection. So let's just recap. Um, if, so natural selection, uh, the logic was like this, three conditions need to be met, three conditions need to be met, and if those three conditions are met, something will inevitably follow. The three conditions are this, if any trait, whatever it is, skin color, plumage brightness, tail length, uh, you know, muscles, what, whatever, vision, uh, if there's variation from individual to individual in that trait, it is variation color or size or plumage or whatever, if that's the case, and if that variation is heritable, that is yellower males have yellower sons and duller males have duller sons, or larger males have larger sons, or larger females have larger daughters or whatever, and smaller females have smaller daughters, right? If there's variation and if that variation is heritable, and if that variation is associated with a differential reproductive success, if brighter males have more offspring than duller males, and because it's heritable, those more offspring will be brighter. If larger females have more offspring than smaller females, yeah, who, and those offspring will also be larger because largeness is heritable. If these three things are met, then in the next generation, the population will look different. That means that whatever the fraction of large and small females in this generation, if large females have more daughters or more offspring and, and uh, those offspring are larger, then in the next generation, the average size of the population will be larger than before. And that is evolution uh, by natural selection, the shift in what the population looks like from one generation to the next generation. That makes sense? Okay. And therefore the traits, uh, the outcome of all this is the traits that are associated with greater success, greater number of offspring, those will become more and more abundant and will become widespread in the population. Whatever those traits are, you know, whether it's largeness or brightness, or better vision to escape predators, or better vision of a predator to see prey, whatever it is, that will become, we expect that to become more widespread. But remember that what Moshmi says, there are always trade-offs. You can't become indefinitely large, because the larger and larger you get, the greater and greater cost you have to bear in terms of food intake and your structural ability to bear that load and all kinds of other things, right? So it, that doesn't mean that natural selection always leads to, you know, everything should become elephants then, if uh, if, uh, if size is always, large size is always better. So that's the, natural, the logic of natural selection. And of course, the success is in terms of number of offspring, and the number of offspring is determined by both your ability to survive and your ability to reproduce. Not only your ability to reproduce, and not only your ability to survive. <laughs> That makes sense, and of course, people have put on an additional sophistication over there, saying it's not just the number of offspring, because I can produce a large number of tiny, tiny offspring that are very unlikely to survive. It's actually a combination of the number and the quality of my offspring. Yeah. Again, nobody's thinking this. I need to produce large number of high quality offspring. I don't think they're making notes to themselves in their iPads or whatever. No. Um, but it's an inevitable outcome of the way that evolution by natural selection works. So, is that clear, the logic of natural selection? Mm -hmm. This is the stuff all of you should already know, except uh, I'm not sure how well that logic is, is embedded in your mind. It's a very, very important set. It's, it's if, 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 then this is what's going to happen, okay? And this is a mathematical inevitability. If you can prove that one of these is missing, then evolution by natural selection will happen. Uh, and, but as long as all three are present, it will happen inevitably. 
Darwin in 1971 proposed an additional mechanism because he was worried about this, our, our uh, favorite bird over here. In fact, he was so worried about this particular bird, he wrote in a letter to one of his friends, he said, the sight of a peacock's tail, whenever I look at it, makes me sick. The sight of a peacock's tail may, may, makes him sick. And that's because in his earlier theory of natural selection, he wrote that, you know, survival, uh, or rather he focused on survival, right? And those animals that can survive, they can find food better, uh, you know, uh, compete with others who would rather eat your food, you know, that was paramount. But this peacock's tail, or technically the train, the feathers are the upper tail parts, they're not the tail itself, the tail is always small and below, but the train is the, the upper tail coverts is what gives that what we call the tail, um, is very clearly a hindrance to survival, right? It's like this peacock is carrying on this big burden and uh, whether it's dogs or jackals or whatever else is, you know, likes to hunt uh, peafowl, obviously males that have this train should be easier to catch and eat than males that don't, or not as mobile, not as agile. So this was a slap in the, his face and Darwin was a you know, fair man. He, he sought out examples where the natural world provided a contradiction to the predictions from his theory, which we should all do. We should always look at what, is there anything out there that refutes our favorite idea? And he thought this was one of these things. And he thought and thought about it and he came up with a new idea, which is a bit of a modification of uh, his theory of evolution by natural selection. He called it sexual selection. And everything applies. But here, sexual selection is used where uh, animals of the same sex differ in their ability to access mates. Uh, because to reproduce, you have to access a mate. You have to have a mate, one or more mates, right? And and for, and he, with this theory, he, he said, he thought uh, that he successfully tackled this problem. So now the resolution of this problem is that yes, peacocks with those large trains find it harder to escape from predators. But if females only mate with peacocks with large trains, then they have to grow them because any peacock that doesn't grow that will never get access to a mate. Well, it's not enough to survive, you have to reproduce as well. And if your reproduction is constrained by your access to a mate, then all kinds of things will evolve that would not have been predicted by his earlier pure theory of natural selection. Okay? So sexual selection is the theory that uh, is used to explain the evolution of these extravagant ornamental traits far beyond what we would expect otherwise for a, an animal to just make a living. Um, like the paradise flycatcher's uh, uh, tail or the crazy displays you see in uh, Birds of Paradise. You've seen some of these uh, Atmuro um, uh, movies. Absolutely mad, mad sorts of things. Or the display flight of the lesser florican and so on. Right? So these anomalous things are explained by sexual selection. We don't today think of sexual selection as a separate process from natural selection. Natural selection is seen as a larger set that encompasses sexual selection as well. So I wanted uh, to tell you a little bit of the theory so that you understand where all this is coming from. So if we use this framework to revisit our, uh, our discussion about mating systems, uh, we have to think about all this in terms now of how does it make sense if we ask it the, uh, the evolutionary question, then we always come down to what's the fitness, what's the reproductive success, what's the consequence? Yeah, how do animals maximize or plants maximize their fitness, which is essentially reproductive success, accounting for the fact that offspring have to be of high quality. Yeah, so that's where you have to optimize your your phenotype, you optimize your characters. Remember, nobody's thinking, oh, I've got to optimize. But evolution by natural selection and sexual selection will inevitably lead to an optimization of this. Um, and so when we look at monogamy, we should ask, okay, uh, in what way does monogamy optimize or maximize the reproductive success for females, but also of males on average? What is it that males are getting out of this? The same thing with polygamy, uh, um, uh, polygyny, for example, you have to ask, there are lots of males that don't have mates. What's going on with them? And there's a lot of pressure for those mates, males, to take over territories and therefore get access to mates. Some of the most extreme examples are in a system called lecking. Um, lecking is best known in, uh, in antelope, where there are males different tiny territories, sometimes it's just about you know a few square meters, and they're all clustered together, lots and lots of males. 
And females pass through and seem to choose a male, male to mate with and then they leave and take care of the offspring on their own. So there's no male parental care in lecking uh, species. Uh, peafowl are a good example and there are a couple of other bird lecking species and there's been some, sorry? Painted snipe also uh, seem to like, uh, there's several shorebirds which of which painted snipe is one um, uh, appear to lek. I just want to mention that, that term to you because you might come across it. Um, the couple of confusions in all of this, we've talked about those sort of mating systems, the monogamy and polygyny and so on, but that's based on looking at the birds. Where are the birds? There's a male and there are multiple females, or there's a female and there are multiple males. Aha, I think I know what's going on. It turns out that we don't actually know what's going on. Because the pattern as we see is not necessarily the same as how the, bird, how the birds reproduce. So we assume, oh, this male has got three wives, or that female has got three husbands. And because we use that terminology and we are human, we assume that, you know, so the wives and the husbands, they mate, and that's it. Um, but in fact, from the 80s, late 80s onwards, when people started checking this out using molecular markers, first protein markers like Anand uh, mentioned, and more recently DNA, they've often found mismatches. That you see that the, the chicks in that nest no, they don't match the DNA signature of the male that's in that territory. But in fact, in, instead, they match the DNA of the next neighboring male. And this, what's called extra pair um, parentage, that is, parentage that's outside the social group that we see, is now known to be extremely common uh, among birds. So there's a mismatch very often, not always very often, between the social mating system versus the reproductive mating system. Um, this is not just in birds, it's in mammals as well. Uh, it's in humans, but don't tell anybody. Um, and, um, and they result from what are called extra pair copulations, which are result in extra pair fertilizations. And these now these modern techniques have allowed us to assess how common these are. In some of the large, long-lived um, birds that are monogamous throughout their lives, that have the same pattern throughout their lives, like cranes and albatrosses and so on, the level of extra pair fertilization or extra pair paternity is zero. Okay, there is no mating outside the pair. But in most other birds, birds especially those that change their mates every year, um, not just in monogamous but also in polygynous species, extra pair paternity can be extremely high. I think the highest rates are something like 60 or 70 percent. 60 or 70 percent of the Children, the offspring in that territory do not belong to that male. And uh, much more frequently, it's more like 30 or 40 percent. So a large fraction of the offspring are not, don't belong to that male. So we can't trust our eyes anymore. We can't just look at the social setup and say, oh, we know what's going on. Okay, there are things that are deeper than that. And um, there's a lot of research happening over there. And that leads to something which was completely misinterpreted right from the start. 80% of bird species are monogamous, socially monogamous. Now we'll call them socially monogamous because they're not reproductively monogamous. 80% of bird species are socially monogamous. And uh, observation right from the start was that um, uh, in a monogamous pair, the two individuals would stay very close to each other in the breeding season. And they would never be found far away in the territory. They're already close to each other. And lots of stuff, poems and stuff have been written in England about you know how Monogamous birds are an example for humans to follow. They're so faithful to each other. They always stay close together. They're so devoted to each other. Uh, this is the what was said uh, for a long time, for decades, <clears throat> until in the 80s and 90s, as I said, we start to realize that actually they may be socially monogamous, but they're not sexually monogamous. They're not reproductively monogamous. And an entirely new interpretation came up on this observation that the birds stay close to each other. And then people started to look more carefully, and they started to notice that females would move and the males would follow very closely. When females move, the male would follow. Uh, and then it was postulated that actually what's happening is the male is guarding the female against the attentions of other males. Yeah? And whenever you come up with this an idea like this, you have to test it. You can't just, you can speculate of course, but the idea is to try and understand, can I, uh, how sure can I be that this is the case? Um, and so there are some predictions from this that can come up. Uh, if it's true that males are guarding females against the attention of other males, 
then one prediction, for example, is that this guardian should be especially strong when the female is fertile. And we know exactly when passerines are fertile, they are fertile from the day before uh, the first egg is laid, or the maximum fertility is then, and they lay one egg per day, typically passerines do, and once the last egg is laid, then that's it. So if this fertile window is five days long, and if we look at how close the males associate the females before that, and how closely they associate after that, we should see a difference. And indeed you do. Right? The, max, the, the tightest um, uh, sort of following happens right in that fertile period. Yeah? Another prediction is that if males did not guard their mates, then a neighboring male should come and the female should mate. Maybe not all the time, but quite frequently. That's a prediction. And you can test that prediction. You can catch the male, put him in a cage behind a bush so that uh, nobody can see him. And then you watch what happens in that territory. And sure enough, in many cases, uh, well, in some cases, a neighboring male comes in, which is what we expect with our, uh, our gender bias. But in many cases, females go out. A female looks around, the male is missing, she flies immediately to the next territory, mates with the male and flies back. Okay? So let's not you know, have these preconceived notions about which sex should do what. All kinds of things are possible. And before knowing about this extra pair fertilization, nobody ever thought to even look for any of this stuff. Because we are entrenched in our worldview, no? And then once this opened up, then suddenly people uh, began to look at things differently. It coincided also, and I don't know how much cause and effect, it this revolution in how we think about the relationship between the sexes in the animal uh, kingdom coincided also with uh, a much greater participation of women in, uh, you know, in the professional workforce. Women behavioral ecologists, women ecologists, um, it wasn't only the women who came up with these, these alternative ideas, but I think that had some contribution uh, that the old ideas that you know females are passive and don't do very much, and males are the one, all the interesting stuff happened with the, the males, that began to go out, even though that's still there, we still think this, but increasingly uh, we're understanding that, that females are very important active, if that's a term, active actors, in this entire game. They fight with each other, they kick each other out, they're competing for other things as well. Uh, so it's really good to have diverse perspectives and to not take our human, we are human, so we always have a human bias. We have to try and put our human bias aside as much as possible when we study the behavior of, uh, of animals. Um, there are other breeding systems uh, as well. There's something called cooperative breeding. Uh, you may know the species. Uh, this is a babbler, a jungle babbler. Um, so far as we know, all the species in this genus, which is Stradoides, all the species are cooperative breeders. In birds, uh, they are cooperative breeders in, across the animal kingdom. In birds, it usually takes this form, that there is a single breeding pair, a male and a female. Uh, and when they have their offspring, then some or all of their offspring stay back. This is weird. Some or all of their offspring stay back within the territory don't disperse and instead they is it flickering on instead they stay back and help to raise the next uh, set of offspring and so on and that's why you get these large flocks of these babblers all year round because they are uh, they're thought to be parents with their offspring that have stayed back uh, from the previous year so of course we know in uh, yeah is it working it's okay um, we call these things, uh, and I don't know in other languages, but in Hindi they're called Saad Bhai, or in some parts of the Hindi speaking world they're called Saad Bhene or Saad Behen. In English they're called Seven Sisters. This I don't know where this seven comes from, it's, uh, it's completely off. You know? the, the flock sizes are in the up to 20 or uh, you know, in 18 or 20, and usually you see above 10. So I don't know where the seven comes from, that's an interesting cultural uh, thing for you guys to um, investigate. And so they, they, um, they help to raise the young, and if you're lucky, you might see something very interesting. So there are only three or four chicks in the nest, and there are about seven or eight or ten of their elder brothers and sisters that are helping to feed them. And there's sometimes so much food coming in that there isn't space, right? And you, you sometimes will see, if you're lucky enough, you'll see an entire queue of the older brothers and sisters waiting by the nest for the that one to go away and then this one will hop in and feed and then that one goes away and the next one there will be a queue. You were standing in a long queue, I apologize for that at lunch, just to feed yourself, but this is a queue to feed uh, their younger siblings. Uh, and this is a fascinating system, more work needs to be done on it, 
uh, certainly with our Indian species, there are lots of very interesting questions. And finally, I want to uh, talk to you about maybe the opposite extreme, uh, which is where the parents don't do any parental care, and um, females just lay their eggs in the nests of a host species, and then they push off. And they don't uh, take part in incubation or rearing of young. Uh, this is called interspecific group parasitism, where one species parasitizes the parental behavior of the other species. This is an example from Europe. Uh, this is a European cuckoo, a common cuckoo being fed by a little bird called a dunnock. This is the parent, or rather the foster parent, of the actual parent. And this is the chick. And there are even more absurd examples of reed warblers. There's a big, massive, hungry cuckoo chick and a little reed warbler parent sitting on its shoulder. So that, that, that big and feeding it uh, food. So basically, they're exploiting the parental instincts of the host species and um, allowing them to get themselves to get away free from the burden of parental care. Now, you are, of course, all loving and empathetic uh, uh, humans. They say, oh, but you know, children, I, I want to take care of my children. Uh, but that's an emotion that presumably the cuckoos don't have. Uh, cuckoos are like, I want to lay my eggs and get as far away from these eggs as possible. And presumably that's the emotion that has, has evolved in, in their system. The most famous, uh, I guess, among these brood parasites also I've been lucky enough to work on uh, is the coil. We all imitated, you know why we did those two species, no? The, the peacock and coil. Um, and they famously parasitize crows. Crows are famously smart, but clearly they're not smart in this aspect of their lives because the coils clearly do fool them and lay their eggs in crow nests, even though the coil eggs are quite different. These are coil eggs, these are crow eggs. To you and me, they look very obviously different. But uh, crows sometimes appear to differentiate and throw them out, but mostly accept these. And these are the chicks. Again, this is the coil and this is the crow newly hatched chicks. And again, to your and my eyes, they're quite different. The skin color is different. I mean, they're starkly different. But the, the crow. So there's a large number of questions to be asked there. How do the brood parasites fool? The, the host, why does the host recognize either the eggs or the chicks? And when the blue parasite is, the chick is in the nest, and in the case of coils, the coil, uh, the coil chick is raised with lots of crow chicks, but the crow chicks grow very fast. They grow faster and they become much larger. How is the coil able to survive even with all these, you know, three, four fat, big crow chicks? Because it's thought that in uh, birds, mostly, they respond to you know the size and the sound of the chicks in their nest, and they feed accordingly. So, what tricks do the coils have to be able to get enough nutrition to survive in this situation? Right, so, we've done a, a large survey of all kinds of things with mating system and sexual selection and other kinds of uh, reproductive uh, strategies. We've still just scratched the surface. There's so much fascinating stuff to talk about and to and to do uh, research on, but we'll stop for now.